Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is the 50th and final episode in a series that started on the 10th of December, so almost two months ago. And, uh, you know, I'm really feeling quite burnt out after doing this for almost two months. We started episode one talking about neglect and whether her parents felt that they neglected her or not. One does get a sense to some extent from John Bonet in that very first episode in terms of what she said to the gardener, that she missed her father, that he wasn't around as much as she wanted him to be. And so that is one trope that I wanted to take kind of into this narrative, a trope that you don't really hear um, very often, is this whole idea of neglect. It has echoes in the grand jury Uh, decision in the indictment which was buried and we're going to touch on it again lightly in this episode. What we're going to do in this episode is look at three photographs that you may not have seen before or if you have you may not have thought of them in the way that we're going to uh, talk about in this episode. One is a image of John Bonet with Burke, uh, probably taken around Easter time. The second is John Bonet with Burke, also in the frame uh, beside the Christmas tree. She's sitting on her bike, her brand new green bicycle. He's not sitting on a bicycle. He's standing sort of, it's like, what Christmas gift did you get, Burke? So we don't see him with his Nintendo 64. Um, in an earlier image that we've seen for some time, you, you see John Bonet cheering behind her bicycle, almost as though she's ecstatic that she's gotten exactly what she wanted. And then finally, we're going to deal with the last known photo of John Bonet. And that'll probably be in the Patreon section. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment. Thank you to the 100 or so who've subscribed since the last video and the half a dozen or so who've joined Patreon. And let's get started. So in the previous episode, we spoke about mise-en-scene. And in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about tropes. Now, trope is a figurative or metaphorical use of a word or expression, or it could even be something like a image. And um, you can have, for example, a pictorial trope. Now, when we talk about that, it's something that is representing something else. And so the tropes that we've seen in terms of the pictures of John Bonet thus far in the past almost 25 years have typically been a picture of John Bonet with her mother, right? And besides that picture, I guess you could say it's that picture of herself with Burke uh, by the Christmas tree where they're both opening gifts and they seem to be quite content, right? Even though John Bonet is her back to Burke. One thing that I think is interesting about the let's call it the family album is that you never see you never seem to see the whole family together it's John Bonet with Patsy it's John Bonet with Burke but in terms of that last um, you know that last day that she was alive you don't see pictures of John um, you don't see pictures of John Bonet with John Burke with John Patsy with John John's not part of it but you also don't see Patsy with Burke or um, uh, John Bonet and Patsy with Burke, which I think is quite interesting. Now, the first image of the three that I want to spend time on is the one of John Bonet on the bicycle, right? And what you can see in that image, if you look just to the right as the viewer of Burke's uh, left leg, 
it's basically between Burke and the pile of gifts on the right. You can see the carpet on the ground and you can see a, a slight pattern on the carpet which is something it looks like it could be a leaf or, or plant of some kind. Well, around about um, 24 hours later, um, probably a little bit more than that, maybe um, 36 hours after this photo was taken, John Bonet would be lying on that carpet, deceased with a cord around her neck, cord around her wrists. She would, I think, be wearing the top that she's wearing in that image. She'd be wearing that. And what is also interesting is I don't think um, what she's wearing there, I don't think the long john she's wearing there are the same as the long john she's wearing. You could say that those are pajama bottoms, but whatever she's wearing there is not the same as the boys' pajama bottoms that she's wearing or the boys' long johns that she's wearing when she's deceased on the carpet. Something else that I think is worth noting is the pajamas that Burke is wearing in that image are the same as those that he's wearing on Easter, which is, it looks like it could be Easter, it could be, could not be. But I do suspect they're from different parts of the year, simply based on uh, John Bonnet's hair in the, uh, the image with the eggs. Her hair seems to be fairly straight and flat, whereas on the on Christmas morning it's quite curly. And Burke's hair also looks like it might be a little bit shorter than in the other image. Now the question is, are those pajamas the same as those blue pajamas that are in John Bonnet's bedroom? Actually, sorry, the bathroom on the ground, the soiled pajamas. And I would say that they're not. They, those pajamas look lighter in color. It's possible if you turn them inside out that they a lighter shade of blue. I don't really think so. If I had to guess, I would say that those are a different pair of pajamas. That could either mean that they uh, another pair of pajamas belonging to Burke or that they're somebody else's pajamas, which I think is a little bit unlikely because I'm not sure how many other children were soiling their clothing at that point. Now, you might notice in this video that a lot of the other images, the newspaper headlines, the crime scene photos, the various characters in the story, the appearances on CNN, the photos from the front of the house, the photos of the snow, the um, close-ups of the grill, um, the pictures from the wine cellar, um, the pictures of the pineapple, the pictures of the toggle rope and the nylon cord, the pictures of the technicians, crime scene technicians coming out of the house, the screen grabs from various films and documentaries, um, the pictures of Burke Ramsey on Dr. Phil, and so on and so on. That has been taken out of this particular video and what I'm trying to do is bring the focus back to Burke and John Bonnet and John Bonnet and Burke. And you may remember that the very first, if you look, go back right to the beginning, the very first title images in the series only had John Bonnet's face on that, on that title image. It was sort of John Bonnet's face, radiant, smiling, seemingly happy, seemingly healthy and... Um, you know, nothing else getting in the way of that. And you look at that happy face and you think, how could this happen? But I think that is a very damaging trope in and of itself. I think the fact that John Bonnet sat down for these photo shoots and that she was made up and she was made up by basically a professional, you know, mother managed all of this, stage managed um, a lot of this and did a very good job. I mean, she did a good job in representing her daughter as a beautiful little girl, right? No one's going to argue about that. But that beautiful little girl isn't John Bonet. And what I mean is, um, John Bonet wasn't that beautiful, meaning, you know, her hair wasn't naturally like that. She was wearing makeup, you know, she was sometimes dressed like a princess. That is not what John Bonet was like. She was a 
a pretty little girl, but she certainly wasn't this um, princess in the way that she was done up for the pageants, right? And you get a sense of the real John Bonet when you look at that picture of a little girl on a bicycle. That's what she really wants to do. That's what she wanted to do on that Christmas day. I think if someone had said to John Bonet, uh, would you like to perform in a pageant today? I think she'd grown and she wouldn't want to do that. Um, and so this is the other face of John Bonet, a uh, little girl who likes having fun, who possibly annoys her brother often, who, um, you know, uh, is just a normal child in, in, in some ways. But the other side to John Bonet is the, or was the pageants, and that is the, um, the lingering um, burden and insight from the trope, which is, you know, that green backgrounded image is giving you a sense of who John Bonet wasn't, but America fell in love with that person. Maybe other people did as well. Maybe other people fell in love with that pretty persona, that pretty person, but that wasn't actually who John Bonet was. And I think that mask, that um, you know, the, the smiling child, the, the the dyed hair, that was kind of a mask covering over the urine and the feces and the dysfunction and the unhappiness and the resentment. And, um, and I find that quite tragic, but I think it is quite emblematic of this case, is that you have these images that we know John Bonet by, but that's not actually John Bonet. And we're going to look at another image now where I think it looks even less like the John Bonet that we've gotten to know through those little video clips and so on. And what's interesting in, for example, the latest documentary like The List, when they show footage of the Ramses over Christmas, it's not the Christmas of 1996. I'm not even sure if it's a Christmas of 1995. It looks like it could be um, 1994. It just is not, you know, and then when you see that, when you see these depictions, these tropes of the Ramsey Christmas, and they're not even of 1996, that in itself is making you wonder, why are there holes in the visual narrative? Why aren't we just not seeing these kids? Why are we not seeing them enjoying Christmas? What's going on? Just a final point to mention is, you know, it it's, may not be surprising to some people. And I think when you see the image, it's like, okay, well, there's John Bonet on a bicycle. It's almost like um, a staggered forward in time image of the other image of her where she's sort of looks like she's shouting for joy or something. But, you know, the Ramses took a picture of John Bonet on her bike because that, that was emblematic for them and for, I think, John Bonet of that Christmas, meaning um, it was a big deal for John Bonet getting the bicycle, this big, bigger bicycle. And I think it was a big deal, you know, it was a big deal for the parents, it was a big deal for John Bonet. And um, I think the bicycle narrative is a big part of the whole narrative. But you're only going to get that if you approach it with child psychology. What I also think is interesting, of course, we haven't seen the entire archive of images, but you don't see Burke with a gift. He's just standing there. That's actually a picture of John Bonet with her gift. Well, where's Burke's gift? Burke is an accessory in a way to that image. Burke is just filling in the space of that particular image. That is really John Bonet with her gift plus Burke kind of thing. When we move on to this other image, and it might feel a bit disorientating because it might feel like we're moving backwards in time. Like I say, this feels like it could be Easter, simply because they are both decorating Easter eggs. You see three um, plates or bowls in front of the children, and it looks like the one closest to Burke is mostly green. The one that is in the middle looks like it's more of a blue color, bluish green, bottle, sort of a bottle green, bottle blue color. And then the one closest to John Bonet looks like it is a 
a reddish color or a pinkish color and so it does look like they are decorating eggs and i would imagine that that is to do with easter and if you look at that image um, look at john benet's face there it doesn't look like the john benet that we know it looks like a um, a blonde girl a pretty little blonde girl but it doesn't look like john benet it looks like somebody else in a way Burke also doesn't look like Burke. It, it, it looks like, there they look like two normal children for all intents and purposes. There's no Christmas fluff and, you know, there's nothing um, much going on in that image except you can see fruit just off to the left. And as I mentioned in the previous video, there was some talk from the, the defense saying, you know, um, the... Uh, case of John Bonnet Ramsey mischievously or misleadingly left out the pineapple in their story, sorry, left out the other fruit that was possibly in John Bonnet's digestive system in the story and that included uh, grapes and this, that and the other thing. Um, you can also see an apple in that image, um, but I th the part that I want to draw your attention to is, and I mean I've already drawn your attention to Burke's pajamas, but it is basically the ribbon in John Bonnet's hair. Now, I could be wrong. That is possibly not a ribbon. It could be the back of a, a kind of a clothing apron. It certainly looks like it could be the same pattern as that apron. But there's also something slightly to the left, which looks like a kind of a blue color that might be part of her hair or something hanging on the door handle behind her. But... What I'm trying to draw your attention to is it does look like something is tying her hair behind her head. Not that this is rocket science. I mean, little children uh, do this all the time. You know, they tie their hair. Um, but I think there are certain styles to what children prefer. They might prefer certain kind of baubles. I think all mothers and daughters know that certain um, hair what you call them, hair um, ties, are preferred by their children and perhaps by their mothers, right? There are certain things that they, that they prefer in terms of the decorative aspect to it, right? And I think that applied to John Bonnet as well. I think I'm going to wrap up the YouTube section of this episode, this final episode in the series, with a with an analogy, my analogy, not, not a photo or trope from the archive. And what I've done quite often is compare um, the dynamics between people, whether it's families, whether it's siblings, whether it's husband and a wife, whether it's between a father and a daughter or a mother and a son, whatever the dynamics are, um, what I often, the way I often think about it when I'm thinking about true crime is I think about the plants in the garden. Now, you might think that that is absurd. You know, how can trees, flowers, um, creepers, grass, bushes, whatever, how can that have any analogy in the complexities of our human society? But, but there really are many. Um, in the same way that a forest has got to organize itself, a society has to as well. In the same way that a family's got to orientate itself in terms of one another, the plants in the garden need to do the same. And I can tell you right now I've got a, a sapling in my garden that is competing with um, orange roses. And so the sapling is trying to assert itself as a tree. And I was in two minds about whether to cut it down, whether to let it do its thing. In the end, I, I cut down part of it, but I'm allowing the sapling to become a tree. Now, you might think, well, not a big deal, but I've already got a lot of trees in a very small, compact garden. I'm trying to basically build a forest, right? That's my bias. That is the agenda that's going on, is that I'm, I'm preferring um, tall um, sort of... Um, uh, vegetation trees and you know that is going to create shade over let's call it lower um, vegetation such as grass and and bushes right 
Um, what is interesting with the sapling is that the rose bush uh, is, is growing very tall, trying to compete with the sapling for light and for space. And um, it's quite incredible how tall these roses are. When I was in France in 2019, I actually saw rose bushes as tall as trees. I saw them taking over the sides of walls. I saw them taking over or growing up telephone poles and light pole, light uh, um, um, what do you call it light, light posts or whatever. Um, about two or three times as high as a person. And of course, these were very old roses, but. The point is that they can grow that high if given the opportunity and and so on, and um, so that's that's roses and and a, and, a, and a sapling. But I can also tell you that um, I've got um, lavender bushes that have now died out because of the um, the shrubbery around them that is taller than what they're capable of getting. Uh, lavender is something that likes the open plain it likes a lot of sunlight it likes um, um, to not it, it doesn't like shade over it and so um, these other plants that are growing at close quarters have basically um, stolen its its sunlight stolen its warmth stolen its sustenance and in, in a garden situation you can see how the plants fight for their place in the sun. It's not. It's by no means a gentle thing, um, and some of the losers do lose their lives. There, there's some that that fight for their place and they have a place, and and another plant will also have its place. But there's some that if they lose this contest, they actually lose their lives. Um, I'm finding that um, grass is starting to struggle to grow because. There's less and less light coming to the ground. Um, as I said, the lavender has now died. I've had to transplant certain plants that have um, that were thriving in one part of the garden, but where shade has progressively increased, they've started to regress. And so I've had to uh, dig them up. Uh, for example, the strelitzias. I've had to move them to where they can get some more sunlight. Um, Something that's also quite interesting are the creepers like the mandevilla. The, I've got quite a few creepers in my garden. And of course, they don't go to the trouble to create stems and the kind of thick bark and the infrastructure that trees would do. And as a result, they can grow a lot quicker. But what they do is they they, they rely on, they become a burden to other um other uh, you know plant structures and so what they can do is literally clamber over the um, the bodies of other plants and deny them the sustenance that they need and so it becomes um, a kind of parasit parasitism a kind of a situation where the one um, benefits at the expense literally of the other and you can apply some of this to, um, you know, a boy and a girl in a Christmas situation where the, the sunlight is the love that they get from their parents, the, um, the sustenance in terms of, um, you know, not just food, but the nourishment from um, healthy narcissism in the sense of, you know, the love and the attention of parents, but given via Christmas gifts and that kind of thing. And you can imagine that there could be quite a strong competition between the children. And usually um, it's not so bad, but you can have a situation where if circumstances are a certain way, that the competition can get very, very serious. And I think you have the same thing with plants in a garden when you take away a certain amount of space and a certain amount of light, well, then it becomes what feels like a life and death struggle for the plant. And in some cases it is a life and death struggle. In other cases it might not be. And the plant might really overcompensate and grow uh, incredibly rapidly. And um, as a result, it could affect other plants in its orbit. 
I think it's also to think about important to think about um, child sexuality in the same way we think about plants. Um, as adults, we've uh, undergone those sexual changes. We we've experienced it. We know what it is. And I think once you're on the other side of that door, it's quite hard to imagine what it was like when you didn't know, you know, about certain things. And I think the only way that you can trick the adult mind into going back to sexual innocence is when you think about plants procreating and it is done in a quite a um, sweet innocent way in the case of the strelitzia for example you'll have a certain kind of bird landing on this really large flower you can google it and by landing on it it sort of uh, sits on like a lever and that creates a situation for pollination um, you know you also have butterflies and bees and and all sorts of other creatures that um, uh, that are attracted by the floweriness the pageantry essentially of plants and that is how they um, you know do their thing but in some, some cir circumstances such as the strelitzia Although it's not quite the same, you have literally you have um, uh, branches and leaves coming out of other branches and leaves, and it's quite amazing to just see how you can have a, a beautiful, a huge leaf folded up inside another leaf, and then it, it sort of bursts out, right? And although that's not quite the same, I think it's very different to human sexuality. I think. There is something about human sexuality right in the beginning that is um, kind of plant-like. It is probing, it is little fingers moving, it is gingerly touching and feeling and, and having a sense of um, to, to begin with oneself but then later on uh, someone else. And although the law only acknowledges the sexual narrative be, uh, at a certain point, I think, and you, you see it in, um, for example, these little animals I've got around me, a, a, a puppy and a kitten, um, you know, they, the, the, the sexual awakening happens before sexual maturity. And I think it's, as adults, we tend to have a bias what that is and what, you know, how that must look. And so... Um, so something that I think is left out of the um, the case of John Bonet uh, narrative is the sexual narrative, and and I think the reason for that is um, is for legal reasons and because it's a minefield. I don't think you can talk about that without getting into serious trouble, which is also why I haven't done uh, I haven't done it either. So for those on YouTube, I hope you found this series uh, illuminating and insightful. Um, we're going to go to uh, the third photo, which is really the most important one of these three photos in the Patreon part of the episode. Uh, for those who've enjoyed this playlist um, and you want to thank me or um, you know provide some gesture of thanks for the work that I've done over the past two months, and I mean, it has been a lot of work every single day, research, recording, um, editing, and so on. Uh, you're welcome to buy merch at the True Crime Rocket Science merch store. I'll put a link in the description. I would appreciate it if you did something like that. You can also buy Christmas Star, whether for yourself or as a gift for somebody else. Um, that's available uh, on Kindle, it's also available in paperback, and it's also available in um, on Audible. Not Audible, as an audio book on Patreon. So, um, and that that book basically deals with the narrative of neglect from the housekeepers. What the housekeepers said about the Ramsey home, the Ramsey household, what they observed, and it talks in some detail about the last photo which is what we're going to talk about in the next section. I previously did a blog post on the last photo and I just felt it is too simplistic to just um, put on its own. There's a lot of subtlety in the John Bonnet Ramsey case in the same way that gardens and plants growing, they grow slowly, they grow invisibly. 
what is happening is subtle and I think the opposite of subtlety is pageantry and I think the reason why it's an unsolved case, the reason why so many people have been confused for so long is that they are bewildered by the pageantry, they're caught up by the pageantry and they don't see through all of that to the subtlety. And I'm not saying it's extremely subtle, just that it is more subtle than the pageantry. Um, something like no footprints in the snow is somewhat subtle. I mean, it's a white uh, substrate and there, there are no impressions on it, but it is as subtle or as unsubtle as you think it is. Um, if, you, if you've enjoyed this um, playlist, if you've enjoyed all of these episodes, there is another playlist on John Bernal. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, I think it's something like eight or ten episodes, but that definitely takes the narrative forward. There are other playlists with many episodes on this channel, including one on Vincent van Gogh that many have enjoyed. There are very many episodes in that particular playlist, so give it a give it a try. There's also one on Amanda Knox, which I think is worth worth listening to. So um, yeah, so if you um, if you want to read about the research into this, then check out Christmas Star on Amazon, and um, I will be putting up an audio book of the first book in the in the series the Craven Silence series, I'll be putting that up on Patreon. I've already put up, I think, two chapters. And then don't forget tomorrow, Valentine's Day, at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I think that might be about 12 o'clock uh, Mountain Standard Time. I'll be doing a live stream where we'll be talking in a bit more detail about the case. I have collected some of the questions and comments that I've come across. So I'll be referring to that, but you're also welcome to um, to join in and um, you know ask questions, make your comments, and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a good interactive experience tomorrow on Valentine's Day. I hope you have a good weekend, stay safe, and I'll see you guys next time. So to be explicit about the last photo, and this was released in 2019.